everyone, I'm Kyle Dyer, and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, January the 5th. And welcome to the three quarters of a million people coming into Colorado for the Super Bowl of Livestock Shows. The 118th National Western Stock Show runs in Denver through the 21st. For this first show of 2024, we have a lot to talk about. So let's get right to our panel. Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward. Elena Alvarez, reporter with Axios Denver. Amber McReynolds, a National Election Administration expert and former director of elections for the city and county of Denver. And then George Brockler, former DA for the 18th Judicial District and current columnist and talk show host on 710 KNUS. Thank you all for coming in. So, on Wednesday, former President Donald Trump asked the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn the ruling by the Colorado Supreme Court forbidding his name from appearing on the state's presidential primary ballot here in March. Trump says the 14th Amendment insurrection ban does not apply to a president. And, Patty, he says he does not believe he was part of an insurrection. No way, he says, was he part of an insurrection. Timing is everything on this, so we're filming it on Thursday. Tomorrow, January 5th, is the deadline for the primary ballot to be certified in Colorado. So the clock, the clock is ticking. Let's hope it's not a ticking time bomb because the problem also is we've got two appeals before the state, the U.S. Supreme Court, one from the Colorado Republican Party, one from Trump, no way himself. So can the, Colorado, the U.S. Supreme Court possibly make any kind of decision by January 5th? It's really unlike, unlikely. They could make a very fast decision on whether or not the Colorado Supreme Court was correct. That's not going to happen. They could decide whether or not they're going to take the case. I'm guessing that's not going to happen. So they'll probably do nothing at all, which means we're going to be in limbo as we head into the presidential primary with Trump's name on the ballot, but not knowing if those votes are going to be counted or not, because that will depend ultimately on whether or not the Supreme Court takes the case and upholds or overturns the Colorado Supreme Court. So again, his name will be on our ballot Unless in something happens very, very, very quickly. Very quickly. Elena. Hi, yes, um, I think it's really, this, this situation presents um, an interesting argument when it comes to ranked choice voting, just as a side note, because you know you have millions of Colorado Republicans and unaffiliated voters whose vote may not count, and they could have a chance if ranked choice voting was in place uh, to have their vote count with a second tier candidate. Um, what's interesting to me, uh, apart from this whole entire election being completely unprecedented, is the way that it's unprecedented unprecedented uh, with the Colorado GOP's own action. So they're uh, planning a meeting later this month to uh, decide whether to endorse Donald Trump and basically um, persuade other voters to vote for him too. That's unusual because according to Colorado politics reporting, they don't usually, they have a longstanding policy of not getting involved um, in, in, pri in primaries, uh, contested primaries, they stay neutral. Um, so this is affecting the state in a lot of ways, and it's just turning into a complete madhouse, of course, because Donald Trump, of course it is. He doesn't know how to play by the rules. There's a lot of steps that happen in election offices around the state uh, to prepare the ballots, to program the election, get ballots out to military and overseas ball uh, voters, which starts 45 days out from the March primary, which is mid-January. Um, so there's a lot that has to happen for all of this, uh, for the March primary to even occur, uh, just from an election administration perspective. And the lack of clarity uh, creates issues for uh, the timing of all of this. And I agree, this is another argument for ranked choice voting. You have all heard me say this before, presidential primaries with a large field of candidates. We have seen millions of Republican and Democratic voters lose their votes in 2016 and 2020 because they cast a ballot for someone that ultimately dropped out by the time the election came around. And this is another example of where you've got this lack of clarity or you've got a, a protest or a challenge happening with a particular candidate. Uh, ranked choice would not make that so difficult for voters because they could have at least their second choice be counted if something happens where he's no longer on the ballot. And that is something that we will be voting on in November, ranked choice voting? There's there's some issues in front of the title board uh, right now that's looking at that uh, going forward. And there's um, that the same package of reforms includes a couple different things. Ranked choice, it includes a f an actual open primary. It also includes addressing the vacancy issue, which we'll talk about. 
we will be talking about that. One, first off, rank choice voting, only a couple people understand how it works, and they're both named Amber McReynolds. The other thing is, and I'd love to come back and have that conversation another time, in terms of uh, the Supreme Court's intervention here, timing matters, but really outcome matters more than that. I don't have any doubts that he is going to be placed back onto the ballot and the decision of the Colorado Supreme Court will be overturned. That's not what's important. What's important here is that the Supreme Court find a way in a timely manner to issue as close to a unanimous opinion as possible, and that would require probably narrowing that legal issue. Uh, America can't survive another 6-3 vote that is viewed as, hey, three of the people that voted for this were put in place by the guy they're putting back onto the ballot. What I'd like to see is the Supreme Court act more quickly than I think we think they're going to, and then to find a way to win over the Katanji Brown Jacksons, the Kagans, the Sotomayors, and figure out a way, how do we write this so that we can tell America, this is why we're overturning it. We're not talking about insurrections. We're not talking about anything other than applicability to this or due process here. Um, that's my hope. The ranked choice voting topic is so interesting, but in this case, it would not solve things because whoever, if tr their vote for Trump is not counted, no one who wanted to vote for Trump is going to believe we've got a new good system in place. They're going to think they're going to deny this election too. Can you steal a ranked choice voting election? <laughs> Ask Amber. Well, She's the expert. I mean, some of those same people are already questioning New Hampshire's primary before it's even happened. His campaign, he himself, has already started to raise questions about a primary that hasn't even happened yet. I mean, this is a this is a con this has been a constant narrative. He wants to cast out, and and he's going to continue to do it regardless of the election, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. Okay. After the presidential primary in March, there will be primaries in June in Colorado for the congressional seats, and those ballots will look a whole lot different than what we thought they would. Just a couple of weeks ago with Lauren Boebert saying that she's now running for Ken Buck's seat. She's switching districts. And it is the talk of the state and beyond, Elena. Certainly. I mean, this really underscores her fear of losing to a Democratic opponent, Adam Frisch, who only lost her by a few hundred votes in 2022. Um, I think... Bobert faces major backlash. Number one, this is a risky decision. You know, she's got a serious challenge on her hands trying to explain to the people of CD4 where she doesn't move. To be fair, she said she's going to move there, um, but why she felt it was necessary to leave her own home uh, and, and, you know, jump ship. A lot of people are are criticizing her for basically clinging to power in some ways. It's being viewed that way. Um, and she's also entering a really crowded race. We have uh, Mike Lynch, the House Minority Leader, who just jumped in this week. He's probably going to prove a formidable opponent. Um, and that, you know, as much as that might uh, prove a challenge to her, on the other hand, it could potentially help her chances because all of her opponents are going to be really competing for the anti bobert you know, vote. Um, and when it comes down to math, essentially, you know, they could all sort of undercut each other and ultimately lead her uh, with the most votes. So it'll be really interesting. I don't know how CD4 voters are feeling right now, um, but we'll, we'll be watching closely and looking to their voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amber. Well, in most elected office positions, local, state, uh, you actually have to live where you're running for office. So that's, that's been handled by state laws and various things. Article 1, Section 2 did not clarify that, partly because when the founders wrote the Constitution, geography was not as, uh, as dense and, and complicated as it is now. I mean, it was, it was more whole states were part of that representation process. So, uh, so you know, this is an example, frankly, of, of a constitutional provision that doesn't have the specifics that, frankly, it should to ensure fair representation. It, the bottom line, I mean, I, you know, obviously disagree with you not having to live in the district to run for Congress, but the voters of CD4 are going to have to decide if they think they will be fairly represented by someone that doesn't live there, and if they're okay with writing big checks for uh, the significant travel it's going to take for her to get to the western slope to the eastern side of the uh, of the state, and, and the time that she's going to spend doing that if she doesn't actually move to the district. George, you had her on your show for quite a bit yeah. the other day. 
Yeah. Answered some of these questions. She did. I mean, look, she's going to move into the fourth, or I, whether or not that happens tomorrow, next month, or before the election, I'm certain that she'll at least have signed a lease agreement somewhere in the fourth. I, I think the problem here for her is that it's of such an unprecedented nature, and the approach to it is also so unprecedented, you can't help but try to envision a frog with one foot on two different lily pads trying to figure out which one to get onto. And that lends itself to criticism. It lends itself to attacks by opponents. But at the end of the day, I don't think any of that's going to matter, especially if you have 10 people in the race. The name ID is the name of the game when it comes to primary ballots. This isn't going to be decided, I think, in an assembly. This will be a primary. My guess is there's no way she makes this decision without having polled at least her name strength in the fourth. And if she didn't see something like, I smoked the rest of the field by a bunch, she doesn't make this move. I think that's happened. So all of these are legitimate conversation pieces to have legitimate criticisms. I'm going to end up moderating a debate that the women of Weld are putting on at the end of the month where she and the other 18,000 members are going to be there. They're, I presume this will come up. But at the end of the day, all things being the way they are right now, I still think she wins. Do you? I do. And what do you think will happen with the third? I think, you know, the, the, the other person that used the F word um, after she announced was Adam Frisch because everything was about her, every single thing. We didn't have to hear a, a word about what Adam Frisch stands for, his background, nothing, because it was all get Bobert, get Bobert. Well, she's gone now. She's moved over to a plus 27 district where the amount of money is irrelevant that gets spent against her. He's now in a plus nine. I think the interesting entrant into that will be uh, Ron Hanks who has jumped in. Jeff Hurd, I think, is probably the front runner right now. Ron Hanks, who weirdly calls Jeff a rhino. This is based on a guy who, by the way, pledged to support the Republican nominee for the Senate if it wasn't him, and then promptly campaigned for someone from another party when he lost. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And rhino stands for Republican in name only. And nobody knows what it means other than you don't support Trump. That's it. Okay. All right, Patty. Well, the only person who looks more out of it than we did in our end of the year show, because this happened after we'd already taped that show, is Adam Frisch, who was really in a good position with the no, no Boebert vote to win this time. And now I think with Jeff Hurd, he would certainly have won without the Ron Hanks jumping in. I still don't think Ron Hanks will beat him in a primary, so the odds are good. He will take the third. And I haven't heard this interpretation of how Boebert will do so well because I think people in the fourth are peeved. They perceive her as a carpetbagger just as she perceives Frisch as a carpetbagger. So we'll see if one if they can coalesce the anti-Boebert group there in favor of, say, Lynch or Holtorf or one of the other candidates enough to let them get out of the primary, in which case they will win against the Democrat. Let's bring our focus now to the state level. The legislative session starts this coming Wednesday, the 10th, and we have a Republican lawmaker suing over how things were handled during this special session regarding a tax credit bill. And then there's a Democrat posting complaints that she has been expelled from her state capitol office. And there are two positions that are having to be filled by vacancy committees because the lawmakers who were in those spots said it was too toxic, they had to get out. Again, there's a lot of work before our state, Amber, and there's just so much other stuff going on. Well, it'd be great if everyone focused on doing what's right instead of instead of these sort of um, these sort of fights over over various things. On the on the vacancy side, uh, I've brought this up for years. I think we've got a, a problem with our vacancy process. It's chosen by a very small group of people from each party. Um, about 30 percent of the legislature currently are in their positions from this vacancy committee process not being elected directly by the voting uh, populace. We've got 45 percent of Coloradans are unaffiliated. They have chosen and voted for an, a, a primary, a semi-open process uh, to choose their elected representatives. And so the vacancy committee uh, process, I think, has been flawed for a long period of time. Uh, I'm happy to see that there's an initiative, at least one initiative so far, that is before the title board to possibly fix this and make it more consistent with other states that actually fill their vacancies with an actual election. Um, that would be far more fair to the voters of Colorado if that happened. George? It's exactly 30 right now. 26 Democrats and four Republicans have made their way into representation. 
without having to stand before the voters. It's a problem. Uh, I think for me, though, this is a grab the popcorn kind of a legislative session as we head into the election year because you have people like Elizabeth Epps and Tim Hernandez who are going to bring their own circus tents with them into this process. When you are part of a party that has managed to come up with 19 of 65 members in the House and nearly a super minority in the Senate, there isn't much you can do. Mike Lynch was on the show this morning and said, I think about 90 percent of everything we do will be defensive. Um, that sets up for some entertaining things, but some scary things, I think, for the state of Colorado. These are the problems, these things about I'm moving my office and I'm being treated poorly and the toxicity. These are the products of dominant one-party control. There is no need to have the kind of decorum you would otherwise expect if you never have to reach across the aisle, if you never have to work on a coalition. Maybe they do within their own party, but uh, this is gonna be a very interesting legislative session. Mm -hmm. Patty? Well, on the vacancy committee beat, you have 60, I think it's about 67 people total voting for, oh, 180,000 Coloradans for, the, Coloradans for these two vacant seats. So Ember's right, that has to be changed. There, supposedly it's going to be more expensive, but at what is the cost for us not to let people elect their own representatives? And we're seeing part of the cost because people aren't being thrown out by the voters because of bad behavior. People are actually choosing to leave because of the people who are not being held accountable. So we'll see how this legislative session goes. Let's hope everyone can behave. Let's hope we have no more reasonable people resigning because we can't afford to lose a single other one. Mm -hmm. Something that will be really interesting on top of the Democrats' own like self-inflicted drama is the fact that they they have a new challenge, um, which is dealing with a lot leaner of a budget this year. And that's because um, a lot of the federal post-pandemic dollars that were flowing in are, are drying up. So not only are they going to have, you know, they have little less to work with, they also have a lot of um, tension that is going to create even more challenges with, you know, handling this major challenge at hand. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be really interesting. I think as far as legislative priorities go, housing will be a big one. I know we've talked about it at, at this table, but um, they didn't have a lot to show for last uh, session as they promised they would. Uh, so they have a lot to, you know, show voters this time around. On December 31st, Denver Mayor Mike Johnson reached his goal to house 1,000 homeless individuals by the end of last year. And then came, that came at the cost of $50 million. But then on the 2nd of January, Tuesday, $180 million is the number that Mayor Johnson gave to the city council. That's the estimated cost for the city to deal with the migrant crisis this year, George. It's enormous, the cost. Yeah, this is a Zoics moment too, and it's all self-inflicted. We have done this to ourselves. While setting ourselves up to be a sanctuary city, we became a target city for guys like the governor of Texas to say, I'm gonna drop off busloads of people. And we know from Tony Kovaleski's reporting, uh, just within the last few days, 20 busloads of migrants were dropped off. That's one issue. The issue of having housed a thousand people for, I can't remember what the, uh, the, uh, the, the requirement is, it was something like three weeks or something like that you had to at least be housed to get a thousand people off for 50,000 bucks. I've only got poor public education math skills, but that tells me that that 50 million bucks equates to about $50,000 per homeless person. We could have found a hotel for a hundred bucks a night and housed them in there for close to 18 months and imagine what that would have done for the economy too. It's a staggering amount of money. It's one and done. It's not gonna keep them off the streets forever. This is going to be a, one, my hat's off to Mike, who I like Mike. I think he's a great guy. I just don't agree with his policies. This is gonna be a challenge moving forward. This amount of money isn't going anywhere. It's gonna get bigger. Well, to separate the migrants from the House 1000 initiative, he wound up having to go with hotels. He did do that, if you look at it, because the micro communities that he'd originally talked about right as he went into office in July haven't worked out. We had one open so far. They're still moving along that way, but he had to pivot and come up with another way to get a thousand people off the streets. We were wrong in our last show of the year. Uh, he did hit the number, but the biggest challenge is ahead, which as George says, you have to make sure that people are not just off the streets, but that they are living good lives. They're learning how to live better lives, not going back onto the streets, learning work skills, figuring out how they can do things. That's gonna be the huge challenge for that group. And then the migrant issue, whatever you wanna think about Texas and the border crossing, there's no question these people are here. They're in a really tough situation. They want to work. 
federally they cannot work. And so that's the first thing to work out. Can there be some kind of work permit for them? Every time you talk to one of the migrants, they're like, we want to work. Yeah, it's really sad to see two uh, populations in need competing for resources and really strapped resources at that. I mean, the fact that the migrant encampment yesterday was able to be cleared and these and migrants were able to be put into congregate shelters was only made possible because city council members pulled uh, uh, roughly $300,000 from their own budgets to make it happen. City officials say this is a one-time thing, this isn't sustainable. And Mayor Johnston went on uh, Meet the Press earlier this week to basically say, we've hit a breaking point and there's going to come a point pretty soon where they are going to have to stop accepting migrants. There's just no place to put them. Nearly every uh, hotel in Denver is already full. Um, every shelter has been exhausted. Uh, it's 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 really it's really sad. Um, something that we're watching pretty closely is how you know Mayor Johnston housing a thousand people is going to affect the new point in time count that's happening um, on January 22nd, which is an annual federal count of uh, Denver's homeless population. You know he's taken a thousand plus people off the street, but we have hundreds of migrants who continue to come in and are finding themselves homeless. Um, so I, I don't really know. It'll be interesting to see how the numbers sort of balance out. Well, I think, uh, so a few things. I mean, this is a result of, again, D.C. being broken and not being able to um, uh, collaboratively figure out solutions that are affecting multiple cities and multiple states around the country. That then puts pressure on local government, which is exactly what's happening in in Denver. Uh, you combine that then with, a, with the homeless issue that has been um, spiraling for, for years for lots of reasons. There can be multiple reasons blamed for that. But I think it's it's not just, you know, if, I feel like a lot of times we sort of, um, it always seems to be government that needs to figure this out. I, I look at it more as it's government plus community plus, plus business plus, you know, there needs to be more um, uh, ideas and creativity around solving this crisis. Uh, than there currently exists because it is that type of issue. It's multidimensional. It impacts all kinds of different folks. Um, the work issue that Patty mentioned at the federal level is significant for, for, for migrants. I mean, there are, I know, multiple entities and businesses that have had job vacancies uh, available, um, including the Postal Service, where I'm a governor. We're constantly recruiting for um, people to come work. And, uh, you know, there are, there is a need, and, and we need the federal government to step up and and uh, create a solution for that so that people can, can live. Now it is the time for our panel to go through and talk about some of the highs and lows of the week. Let's start with something that you really wish you weren't seeing as we start this new year, Patty. Well, I wish we weren't seeing the anniversary, three-year anniversary of the insurrection on Saturday, January 6th, and the kind of hangover it's left with us in threats against election officials, threats against judges, threats against people who sue, you know, to, on ballot issues, and the fear that comes up just on January 1st when there was the very strange man who wound up breaking into the Colorado Judicial Center, and everyone at first thought that was going to be related to election issues. Doesn't seem like it was, but that is a toxic environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of shootings, there was a shooting on Sunday at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, which is a place packed with families, the, the least suspecting place you would think that would happen. And I think it just reflects, you know, a dark time in Denver where it's like, if you can't take your kid to, uh, you know, a, a children's museum and feel safe there, where can you take them? Um, so I was really disappointed to see that. Me too. I want to plus what Patty said. I mean, Election officials, judges, folks that are just simply doing their jobs should not be attacked and should not be harassed for uh, simply fulfilling their duties, their oaths that they've taken uh, to make decisions or to implement uh, election administration. And, and I'm deeply fearful for another year. I want to talk about my own party, GOP, and this thing that we heard about from Elena about uh, the effort to maybe come out and pre-endorse Donald Trump. We're supposed to be the party of principle and procedure, and certainly in a primary, that's what you're supposed to be focused on. Even if this guy is far and away the front runner, and folks, he's going to win the Republican nomination unless something drastic changes, and I think he stands a chance of becoming president of the United States as well. But here in Colorado, foregone conclusion or not, we are about procedure and policy. You know, some of these other candidates have paid sort of a, a fee 
to be or not be at the assembly to the state party. And the state party gladly took that money because they're strapped for cash. And now we're saying we're going to put the stamp of approval in advance of a single vote being cast, whether this guy's on the ballot or not. I say it's a huge mistake. It's a horrible precedent to set, and we ought to back away from it and get back to being the business of Republicans. Okay. Now let's talk about something that you're pleased about seeing this week. Patty. It's stock show season, yeah. the only time of year when I'm appropriately dressed, but it's also such a great time in Denver. Get yeah. out to the, the complex, see what's going on. CSU's Spur Project is incredible. It's just a great 21 days. Yes, it is. All right. On the migrants issue, to Amber's point about, you know, community businesses getting involved in helping with this issue, I saw today Stanley Marketplace in Aurora announced they have a new initiative that they're starting next Tuesday, and I think it's going to be every Tuesday, um, where they're giving migrants a space to uh, sell some of their, you know, show some of their skills, teach cooking classes, do interesting things um, to really support them in a way, you know, they all want jobs, and I think that's an interesting sort of tactic. That's good. Okay. I'm going to say our youth, um, and, and I, I, as I've mentioned on this program before, I have a 10 and 12 year old, and just seeing my son just did a basketball camp with Jamal Murray on Saturday, and and just seeing the excitement amongst kids that whether they're doing their sports, they're doing their activities, they're in school, they're, there's there's a vibrancy to uh, the the younger generations, and I I think celebrating that in the new year is important. This weekend represents the first opportunity since 2016 that the Denver Broncos can have a winning season. Just saying it out loud is shocking, isn't it? It feels like yesterday Peyton Manning was bringing us another Super Bowl victory with Vaughn Miller, and now here we are looking at maybe, maybe getting to our first winning season since before Donald Trump was president. That's something. That's something. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my positive for the week is seeing Denver Nuggets forward Aaron Gordon back on the court and to hear how touched he is from the show of support from his teammates and from all the fans out there. His positive attitude is most impressive after a scare on Christmas when he was bit by his dog. It's scary and unsettling sh for sure, but it's a relief that his injuries are on the men and that he's back where he belongs. I'll be at Sunday's game uh, against the Pistons, so I hope we win, we better beat the Pistons, and I'll be rooting on AG, so it'll be fun. Thanks team here for coming this week, we appreciate you, and thanks to all of you who are watching at home as well or listening to our podcast on Spotify. I'm Kyle Dyer, I will see you next week here on PBS 12.